Modern Monarchy is a family business. There is absolutely no training scheme whatsoever. Just occasionally you remember with a sort of cold sweat how awful you were when you started. With 4,000 royal engagements around the world each year, the Queen depends on her husband. Is he new to this? Her children. You never quite know because um, which bits of you they're recording. And her cousins. <laughs> and now her grandchildren. <laughs> to share her workload. Life and happiness, you, it's, it's okay. It's, uh, it's really good. Yeah. Unlike many other businesses, retirement is not an option. Being royal is a job for life. So what is it like to work for the family firm? Today, the royal family works hard to manage its image and protect itself from unwanted intrusion. It was very different half a century ago. Back in the early 50s, so when, when ever my parents went away, they went away for quite a long time, and it wasn't so easy, the flying and so on. And uh, so when they came back, there were great uh, welcome ceremonies back. Very often they used to do carriage procession to the guild hall where there'd be a lunch, and they'd come back, and then the they come onto the balcony. And I remember as a child, often in, uh, in my room, which overlooked the Mall and the Victorian Memorial, that, you know, you'd, at night you'd hear, we want the Queen, we want the Queen. And then my, you know, my parents would go out onto the balcony. So, I don't in those days it was much more, because there wasn't television in the same way as there is now, you know, there wasn't the same uh, coverage. So, the, everything was much more personal in a funny way, you know, and direct the contact. Nowadays, a young prince's life is very different. Nothing is spontaneous. Security and media intrusion are always concerns. It's 6 a.m., and Prince William and his private secretary are en route to the homeless shelter, Centrepoint, one of the four charities of which the prince is patron. So, you happy about the, um, about the program here? Yeah, very and straightforward. It's good old Roger. Um, the other guy is... Um, Stuart Cox, who I think you met. Yeah, I met him at um, yeah. Campbell. Campbell, Campbell, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. As he has grown up, William has been kept out of the public eye as far as possible, in the hope that he might escape the hounding his mother suffered. But now, in his 20s, the second in line to the throne is taking on more. William and his brother Harry are organising a Wembley concert to mark the 10th anniversary of the death of Diana, Princess of Wales. And um, in terms of the concert, how much do you think we're going to raise from the concert? To search for um, we worked out anything yet? No, I, I think it's it's probably a little bit early early to say, but William's celebrity means that he can help raise large amounts for his charities. You can't beat five million in one day from the city. It's just impossible. Yeah. Um, you know, they, 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 by the fact that the city are giving out, they're, yeah. they're doing this day, and it's true. It's they, true. they do raise a vast amount of money in one day. Yeah. I mean, there's no other place that can do that. Yeah, any more acts confirmed for the concert? Um, no, not at the moment, no. Um, it's going the wrong way. Yeah, it's got to turn around police for not knowing his way around London. That's going to be embarrassing. Yeah, There's no pressure at all. Just got the big TV camera in the back watching. The entire so, honour so of, of the force rests with you, mate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> William's principal advisor and mentor is his private secretary, Jamie Lowther Pinkerton, ex-Special Forces and the Irish Guards. Had a, uh, had a good session with the mix on, on Monday. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> How many of them were there? Um, 40. 40 of you? 40 of us, yeah. Oh, my God, yeah. where the hell did you go? Who let you in, anyway? We went to, I don't know, we ended up in some Irish pub in somewhere in here. It's a Irish building, I love it. Thanks, Jack. Thanks, Jack. William is the monarchy's future, and his relaxed and informal style signals a cautiously new approach to the business of being royal. Uh, Roger, what happened to, what happened to tea? Uh, for <laughs> busy. Tea, for, tea for William, you know, our guest, I don't know. our volunteer. It has not been easy for the younger princes to find a role. 
Prince Edward had a difficult career in business as a television producer before choosing to return to the traditional duties of royalty. The one thing about this particular job, as far as I can recall, is that there is absolutely and precisely no training scheme whatsoever. So um, um, it's actually quite extraordinary that any of us have, have, uh, have, have survived at all. He's planning a ceremony granting a royal charter to his father's invention, the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme. The granting of a royal charter is a very special event. Um, and what we want to try and do is to, is to really mark that event in a very special way. The trustees go this way, and everybody else, and everybody else goes that way. OK? Yeah, thank you. In the end, we want the event to run as smoothly and as efficiently as possible. We've got to coordinate what everybody says. But then actually still leave time for everybody to have a, a reception afterwards and a chat afterwards. So we don't want to take up too much time in there. So it's trying to keep that as efficient and as, uh, as possible. The Duke of Edinburgh is 86, and Prince Edward is taking on some of his roles. One day, he will also inherit his title. How long a fanfare are you? Thinking? Well, as normal, so as short, as quick, as ditty as possible. Really? But, um, if you yes. want it longer, you can have it longer. There are two things. You either want a fanfare that's going to cover the whole procession, i.e. to give enough time to be able to get to the seats, or it is just an announcement that yeah. Everybody should stand up. Are we going to do a national anthem on the way out? It's probably what the Queen expects in the context of investitures. Do we want two anthems, or...? Well, that's what we're doing in the space of... One at the beginning, yeah. one at the end. Yeah. yeah. Um, in the space of half an hour. If you have the fanfare at the beginning and, and have the anthem at the end, as the conclusion... Let's do it that way, then. Because hmm. the fanfare certainly will suffice to attract everyone's That'll attention. That'll get everybody yeah. up, and then... Yeah, and then... Yeah, and, and then... And then, um, and then we can... National we can, anthem you know, at the end. Well, it just doesn't make it too... No. Too stiff, starchy, informal at the at the beginning. The sovereign can only carry out so many things. That's where the family can increase the reach, in a way, of the sovereign and the person that, in the end, we all serve. Individually, um, the themes, the focuses, the interests that we all have are inevitably different because we're all different as, as people and we have different, different interests. Centre Point was one of Princess Diana's favourite charities and William has taken up her commitment to the plight of the young homeless. The Centre Point trying to look for you to help you get another job. Stuart Cox used to be homeless and was helped by Centre Point. He now works as a receptionist for the charity. I would like to come back and give something back to the organisation that, that helped me get my life back on track. And In terms of life and happiness, you, it's, it's okay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Not too bad? It's kind of the same, same, same old story, different day, but no, it's, no, it's no, really it's, good. You know, yeah. so. uh, you've got a house, haven't you? I've got a, a one bedroom flat yeah. in South East London. Yeah. yeah That's the right, is it? Really good. You've got to get your hassle with that. Um, I had a, a bit of hassle at the start of um, with housing benefit continuing to pay, even though I announced to them that I'd got a job. Yeah. And then when they went back to the housing association to claw back their money, they actually took mine as well, which left me with a nasty lump sum of debt. So you tell everyone about that? I did, but nobody was willing to try and take HB to court because really? everyone who's done that so far has lost. Well, um, it's uh, one of the yeah. big flaws in the system of that, unfortunately. It's nice but, um, there is some history. His mother was patron of Centre Point in the mid-90s. She used to visit quite often quietly, come and talk to people. She got, several times she brought William and Harry. When he went to St Andrews, the standard interview that was put out, he referred to homelessness being an issue he cared about, and we noticed that. There were a large number of organisations who would um, frankly die for having Prince William as the patron and last week, I think, were you playing polo? Uh, yes, it was, wasn't it? I yeah. didn't have much time to see you then, did I? Yeah, well, how were you looking? We came, we came behind you looking fairly exhausted, but uh, it's a strange game, polo. It is strange, say. but I, I still don't know how to play it. It's ridiculous. It's all these years I have played it. It's spectator sport, isn't it? Well, it is. It's meant to be a spectator sport, yeah. It's meant to be a spectator sport. You can't see what's going on. It's all... Uh, you need to have a massive ball, though. It's about that yeah. ball. We're busy getting a gospel choir for the ground. I think... Justin Brown gospel <laughs> floated the idea if they're good enough. Is, is, Roger, is Roger the number one man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Roger, are you doing a, a gospel uh, choir discount for the uh, concert? 
No. <laughs> in a word, but, um, no. But yeah, that, uh, that was hovering around anyway, but um, it's uh, whatever, but the concert's great. Well, it's fantastic. Is, it, is, it, is that work for you, or is that work for... No, it's, he's working as absolute sort of... It's his new sort of pop in Presario, music uh, in Presario. Yeah, well, yeah. He's, he's, he's going to be the new Live Aid man after now for this. Except that when we were doing the lifts, I thought it was scissor hands rather than scissor yeah. sisters. His music, his music knowledge is pretty limited. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm afraid I was showing me a age, and I looked down the... People that you've just got so Justin and Duran Duran and. Yeah, I know them. I'm not both. I can't believe it. I know them. At the, point was <laughs> yeah. the, uh, the concert for Diana, where he's chosen us as his major beneficiary, uh, and uh, that's, of course, a huge, huge uh, benefit. It's also a benefit because maybe we'll have some young people involved as volunteers behind the scenes. With William's privileges, wealth, influence, and fame, comes a downside. When William first came to volunteer with us, uh, when he was getting to know us and partly deciding whether he wanted to be a patron, by day two there were paparazzi in the cafe opposite when I came out with him and I was travelling in the car with him. I got a real sense of how it's a goldfish bowl. The royal family suffers from the media's attention to their private lives, but they need publicity for their working lives, to highlight their causes, to show their use and, above all, to connect with the public. You and I the Prince is arriving actually by train and we're going to take a number of press onto the actual platform to witness the arrival. Oh, That'll be BBC television, a PA reporter and a PA photographer. Um, he's due to arrive around about 10.45. Prince Charles is a champion of the environment and he has come to Woking, a town which prides itself on its green credentials. I excited to see him get off a, a regular train. I thought that was quite a, a PR coup. It's the environmentally friendly transport. I mean, he's been hit about that so, on a number of occasions. And uh, normally, even when they do take the train, it's the royal train. So it's a big change for him. It's a canny move, very canny move. Everybody has an opinion on the royal family. Who's your favourite? Uh, Anne, West oh. Princess Anne. Big Anne. Yeah. Really? She's down to earth. That's true. She's very normal. She's Sons. one of the only royals at work. Yeah, that's true, yeah. She's one of the only ones at work, and she works hard as well. Do they get off and don't work, then? Well, they don't do much, do they? <laughs> Prince Charles has spent nearly 40 years doing public duties, and he's become a professional at working the crowds. Have you had, is it delicious, that thing? Like what is it? It's a cup of tea. No, no, no. Right. I might get one later. <laughs> I enjoy people and meeting them. The awful thing is, I suspect I was merely interrupting their shopping activities. Lovely to see you. It's lovely to see you. Well, I hope I haven't disturbed things too much. No, you haven't. No, I always rather enjoy dashing into somebody's shop, finding out how they're managing and what the you know the local situation is. Oh look! How are you? Are you keeping a good eye on the place? Oh, you must come and see us. I'm patron of the organisation. Yes, yes, oh, we heard. Charles, would you give that to Camille? I will. Thank you very much. You are thoughtful. It's very kind. No, she should be thrilled. Oh. He's been waiting for this for hours. Very nice people. They're, they're, they're such nice people, those standards. The challenge the Prince and his family face is how to connect with a new and often indifferent generation. They don't really serve a purpose, do they, the royal family? They only, what do they do? I don't see what they do. Where are we heading for? It's actually been miles. Is it? What is his job? Can you tell me? I don't know. Should I go start from the bottom? I would. And it is recyclable paper, so we're all right. <laughs> You've um, done a wonderful job already in terms of how you can reduce the carbon footprint. Of... Prince Charles has many roles. One job he thinks important is to work behind the scenes to get things done. In this case, a conference for the environment. I only hope we can help to encourage people just to, to, to operate together and talk together for a bit. That The secret surely is to find one person whose job it is to pursue all this, isn't it? Of course, there are probably quite a lot of things that have happened which people don't realise as a result of actually having got people to sit down at the beginning of the day. And sometimes, you know, all sorts of worthwhile things can, can grow from that. Sir Alan Reid is the Queen's treasurer. The royal finances used to be secret. In response to public pressure, accounts were first published in 1995, and they've made the news ever since. Not so long ago, a palace press conference would have been inconceivable. 
Well, we've got all the raw correspondence from national media in this room here. They came in at 9 o'clock. They've been given a copy of the raw public finances report, which will come out later this morning. It's 127 pages long, so they have a chance to study it and to think about what sort of questions they want clarification on. And this is the one chance in the year they get to actually ask direct questions and for me to make a statement on raw finances to them. Sir Alan is used to dealing with a sceptical press. Good morning. Um, I wanted to say a few words about our policy to finance here first. Uh, our key aim is not to try and achieve a low-cost monarchy. What we're really after is to achieve a high-quality, very efficient, very professional value-for-money monarchy. The second part of our policy is that we are spending, and we realise it, taxpayers' money, and therefore we want to be as transparent about it as we possibly can. In all of that, we are reporting that the head of state expenditure this year was 62 pence per person in the country. And that's not a daily rate, it's not a monthly rate, it's the annual cost of the monarchy. We're um, struck, I think, um, as ever by the travel costs. And whereas it cost the staff of the Prince of Wales £45,000 to recce a trip to the US, it cost the staff of the Queen just £15,000 to recce a trip to Australia and Singapore. The recce costs reported here are 15000 The Australian government made a £12,000 contribution towards that. As far as the Prince of Wales trip is concerned, it was a very complicated trip going to the east and west coast of the United States. You can never tell until tomorrow morning's press coverage. I mean, that, that's really the, the key judge of it. And even then, uh, you don't really know how the readers of the newspaper are going to take on board the points that the press themselves are saying. The Keeper of the Privy Purse told us this morning that they're not trying to achieve a low-cost monarchy, but the headline figure is it's gone up from £35.9 million last While year. While opinion polls show that the monarchy remains popular, some claim that they're not worth the money. So we've done a poll that says that 52% of the population don't want to pay any money to them, so whether it's 61 pence or 61 pounds, people just don't want to pay anything towards them. If you talk to any of the Americans lining the mail, there's going to be loads of them. They'll all say the same thing. Oh, gee, we love your queen. You ask them, would you like to take her back with you? They'll always say, oh, no, no, thanks. We're happy the way we are, but we just think she's great. She belongs over there with you quaint folks. That's the crunch point for me. We're not quaint folks. This isn't a quaint country. Britain's an incredibly oppressive country, but held back by the nonsense from the past that we allow to kind of dominate our kind of cultural uh, face that we present to the world. Ridiculous. Get rid of it all. Although the palace is more open about its finances, it chooses not to publish league tables of royal workloads. The unofficial task of totting up the totals is left to a retired insurance broker in the town of Windsor. The Times gets delivered to this house every single day of the year, including when I'm on holiday. So I think I can say from 1980 to the present, I've never missed buying a copy of the Times. And when I finish reading it, I will cut out the court circular and paste it into a scrapbook. And then I will total up the different engagements that the different members of the royal family do. For instance, visits, then there are opening ceremonies, there are galas, sports occasions, receptions, lunches, dinners, investitures. Every quarter I uh, total that up, so I have a, a running total really every three months, and then we get a total for the year. It's very interesting to see what uh, the Queen does, what the Prince of Wales gets up to, and I think somebody that um, would look at this regularly would realise just how busy they are. According to Tim's statistics, published every year in a letter to the Times, Princess Anne is the busiest royal worker. I think she's patron of over 200 charities. 200 charities? Oh, that's what I was told by Kevin this morning, which is amazing. Last year, she carried out a total of 595 engagements in the UK and abroad. Oh, 
Princess Anne receives so many invitations that some people get the royal brush off. Why do I say no? I wouldn't dream of telling you that. <laughs> no, I don't, uh, you have to say no. Quite often, I'm sorry to say, it's because you get clashes, quite simply. You just can't do everything on the same day. Today is typical. Three engagements in Hampshire, then a flight back to London for two meetings, a reception and a dinner. Just on site. Sir. Just on site. Lorraine, we're just on site, OK. The purpose is always to aid good causes. You hope it raises the profile of those who are doing a really good job on the ground, and that's more than anything else. It's probably what you're, you're trying to do. It's nice to be able to, to have a moment to reflect uh, on what they have achieved. If value is judged by the number of visits, Princess Anne comes out on top. Do you try and keep sort of one person to a case, so to speak? So but at the moment, there is no way of gauging the actual benefit of the royal effort. There are not many engagements you could try and measure whether you actually made a difference. Evaluation comes is more the perspective of the organisations you visit. Back in her Buckingham Palace office, there are charities to meet before tonight's reception and dinner. The princess used to be uneasy in public and gained a reputation with some for being standoffish. Just occasionally you remember with a sort of cold sweat how awful you were when you started and how cross everything you said seemed to be. So I think, um, I, I rather hope that I may have improved. I, I think it is about having been around for a long time and finding the ways that, the, the commonalities that people enjoy. And there are many more of those than you would think. When you joined, was, were there other members of the family and the cadets at the same time? Or um, you... No, it was just friends of the family that yeah. was in them at all the family giant. Since Prince Edward gave up his career in the commercial world, he's been working at what the palace calls supporting the Queen. Last year, he had 418 engagements. Thanks so much. Good morning. Sunny Yorkshire. Thank you very much indeed, yes. Quite so, was, it, was it sunny earlier on today? Or, um, or, no, oh. no, yesterday when your sister was here. Ah, was she? Yes. Well, that's typical, isn't it? <laughs> My husband, Marshall Ross. You try very hard to, to avoid conflict, um, but then... Today has been a perfect example. The Princess Royal was only here yesterday, but doing completely different things. Each member of the royal family has different interests and causes they choose to champion. They try not to overlap. The three emotive ones are, are children, animals and disease. Um, and um, you won't find many of those on my list of patronages because you know, they're, they're emotive enough and, and uh, I think they can... I mean, I'll, I'll support them where, you know, as and when, and I'll go and visit things that they're doing. They're doing good work, and, and but I won't necessarily become engaged as a as a patron. But that's just that's my own personal feeling. Prince Edward's wife, Sophie, is happy to take up the sort of causes that her husband foregoes. She's visiting the Berkshire County Blind Society. Her Royal Highness, the Countess of Wessex, is about to arrive in the hall. She has arrived in the hall. Please give Her Royal Highness a warm welcome with your applause. Every visit is, is, is different. You, you have no idea the sorts of characters that you're going to, to meet. You hope that you're going to meet characters, because that always makes it much easier in that sense. Indeed. And I'm wearing a sort of pinky, pinky kind of clothes, yes. And I was just explaining to the lady, your hand. Just, oh, it's got pleats across the front. It's a bit like doing a, an exam, really. You, you have no idea, <laughs> at the end of the day, whether or not you, you've actually scored all the... you know, got the ticks in the right boxes, whether your examiner thinks you've done a good job. Prince Edward focuses on youth, sport and the arts. As a student, he was a keen amateur dramatist. What he learned on the stage has helped him since. Oh, come on, let's talk well, as, as anybody knows, you should never really be uh, <clears throat> seen on stage with children or animals because you never know what they're going to do. And there are always, there are always smart Alex in, in, in the crowd. I used to go to the school. You used to go to the Me? school. Me? Yeah. yeah. I'm the one who did ballet. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Just <laughs> Very good. Plaque unveiling is a royal skill. And the prince is something of a showman. And I'll try and make this look as slick and as professional as possible. There's no knack with plaques. I'm trying to make it a, a bit more than, than just, in a sense, just pulling the cord. It's all gone awfully quiet. 
I, I hate to disappoint you, but, but the unveiling of a plaque is not necessarily the most exciting thing that's happened in your lives. In some places, it's going to be quite effective. We'll try and make this look as slick and as professional as possible. One can actually create quite a good buzz out of it and, and, and get quite a good reaction out of what could otherwise be a really quite a dull um, exercise. Congratulations to you all. There we go. One, two, three. There we go. Quite used to sort of just seeing a sort of sea of cameras and sort of flash bulbs going off, but the, because of the, the way that the mobile telephone works, um, it's got a very small lens, so everybody has to thrust this thing. Everyone, for some strange reason, they're all arm's length. I don't know why, but anyway, so it always makes it look even more bizarre. It's what we call in the trades an occupational hazard. So <laughs> There's always something being pointed in your direction. You never quite know, because um, which bits of you they're recording. So I'm all right, yes. I'm still alive. Urban regeneration is another keen interest of Prince Charles. Daniel Banfield, one of our receptionists. Yes. Is, it, oh. is it the bulletproof glass? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, it's polycarb. <laughs> yes. Oh. Caroline, another one of our receptionists. So, so do you do uh, morning shift? Morning morning shift. shift. Yeah, yeah. Job shift. So the morning one doesn't start too early. No. Oh, so so who does all the cleaning? Uh, Carol, who's gone off because she's exhausted. <laughs> 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 I'm sorry to say. <laughs> oh, so there you go. She's absolutely shattered. Um, you haven't had to paint too much. Uh, well, they have touched up around, haven't you, folks? So um, basically, I do um, have my uses. I thought he was quite funny at times. He's sort of on the ball with the banter, isn't he? He's approachable, he's approachable, isn't yeah. he? That's the way he's up before he's not. He's, at least he just doesn't just shake your hands and walk no, on. He had some space to each and every person. Yeah. He's going to show us an interest. The Prince's Trust, which he set up on leaving the Navy, has helped hundreds of thousands get a start in life. Errol Graham received £500 to set up a music business. Over 30 years ago, um, I do believe I was one of the first recipients of the Prince's Trust. Was it 30 years ago? To <coughs> doing it. Yeah. You don't look too bad on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we received the money, we were supposed to meet the prince the following year. Um, we were young, young men at the time, and we declined. <laughs> um, we kind of seen it as if, like, the prince has inherited a wealth. A lot of that wealth has come from the transatlantic slave trade and so on. So the, the mindset, you know, as a young man was, so we should give us the money. <laughs> it's going on well. Yeah. Um, we seem to have a good rapport, me and His Royal Highness. <laughs> I don't think I, I could move myself like that, though. <laughs> Not in this condition. <laughs> when are you due? July. July. Yeah. I hope it's not too hot, because it's killing oh. me. Tell me about it. I feel so sorry for ladies who have to go through. Oh, and I believe we're meant to be in both hot and summer as well. Great one. <laughs> How many have you had? My daughter's 18, she's doing her A-levels, she wants to be an architect. Um, I'm very brave having another one. Oh, God. Um, well, I'm a bit of a gap. Must have been 18 years old as grandson. I'm, I'm nearly 16 years older than my youngest brother. Mm. It's almost like being another father. This is it. I said, that girl with the long hair is very good. Mm. I always think, you know, I walk in, you know, what would I like if I was in that position? Oh. It can be very difficult, because trying to calm people down, the maddening thing is, I think, is that you, you go through all that, trying to, you know, put people at their ease, and then you have to disappear and go on somewhere else, just as they're getting at their ease, and just as they're realising that you're vaguely human and not some alien from outer space. And then you have to start all over again with another lot who are nervous. Do you see what I mean? So it'd be quite fun to go back in again, the people who've just left. <laughs> Prince Charles's eldest son, William, is just starting to learn the art of the royal visit. It's Peter Hayne, our Secretary of State, to 
This is his first as patron of the Welsh Rugby Union. Wales are playing Ireland, and there are half-time drinks with ministers from both countries. Are you a massive rugby fan? Well, <laughs> all sports. Yeah, exactly. You can see he's got a Welsh rugby yes, union. Yeah. When he eventually leaves the army, events like this will be a daily occurrence. But he's already mastering the art of small talk. <laughs> Look at the difference. So nice, then. First official engagement. I have a suspicion it was actually presenting leaks to the Welsh Guards on St David's Day, but I'm not sure about that. And you were nervous? Oh, oh, yes. You could not be under those circumstances. It's probably changed from sheer terror to just being sort of uh, mildly nervous. I think it's probably the, the greatest, that's probably the... Uh... <laughs> there, are still, there are still moments of terror, but... Um... <laughs> there are times have changed, though, haven't they? They have. A lot better looking now, not they? <laughs> <laughs> the royal family, young and old alike, know they must keep pace with modern Britain. Lord Luce, the former Lord Chamberlain, is among those who has had the delicate task of advising them. Changes that they've, they've said they're prepared for risk and operation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that I like about risk. It's quite difficult from time to time when you need to give what you will hope will be constructive advice to individual members of the royal family. You may well have discussed what you're going to say in advance with Her Majesty the Queen, but sometimes it's advice that you know will be difficult for them to take. The monarchy can't remain a fortress. The monarchy's got to adapt and to adjust without stepping too far ahead. You've got to keep the dignity of the job of the monarch and at the same time balance it perhaps with a little more informality. Occasionally you have to suggest ways in which they can uh, be even more effective in their jobs. And, or if they're changing careers, or they've been doing one thing, the Duke of York was in the Navy, he's moving into trade and investment, doing a marvellous job there. Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, is now the UK's special representative for international trade and investment. Of course, He's not experienced in business, of course. He, he, he didn't come up through business um, in, in the way I did. And he hasn't been intimately involved in the big business issues as I was at the CBI. Digby Jones was head of the Confederation of British Industry. One of his roles has been advising the prince. When we talk about things often in private, he's amazingly well informed. And he has a view. Hello. Hello. Prince Andrew's job is a new departure. It's the first time that the son of a monarch has worked specifically lobbying on behalf of British business. In Barcelona, we have, in the nicest possible way, a few bragging rights, the Brits do. We're very good at this, and we're known around the world as being very good at this. Mobile telephony in all its forms. But these guys have got to, they've got to make a choice as to what exhibition to go to. And yeah. there can only be two or three, maybe even one in, in many cases, and, and 3GSM is the exhibition to go to, in the to world. get in the world. Yeah. yeah. If the Duke of York turned up and said, you matter, you yeah. matter to my country, yep. you matter to all of this, thank you for coming, yep. I tell you, mean the world to them. And, and the, the increase in their morale, the increase in feeling as a small business they matter to the country, mm -hmm. is something which, quite frankly, you do. Now, as long as it's honest, as long as it's legal, as long as it's straight, then, frankly, we would be wronged by this country, by the taxpayer, by the jobs that are created, by the tax that's paid, if we didn't actually use the connection we have. I'm following them. They know where they're going. <laughs> of the 1,300 businesses at the Barcelona Telecoms Fair, 40 are British. Prince Andrew hopes to fly the flag on their behalf. The UK is one of the world's leaders in this particular area of endeavour, so it's, 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 it's a no-brainer to come to an event like this. 
We can all squeeze in the lift with the police. One policeman. <laughs> And the sound man. <laughs> yeah, no more. This is going to be fun. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to welcome back His Royal Highness the Duke of York in his capacity as the United Kingdom's special representative for international trade and investment. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, this is a mobile phone um, event, uh, so please turn your mobile phones off. <laughs> yeah, there's always one. <laughs> this is a very, very important industry to the United Kingdom. We are probably one of the world's leaders uh, in mobile telephony and technology. The traditional work of the family firm continues at Buckingham Palace, where the Queen is often supported by less prominent members of the royal family. Tonight, the palace is preparing for the largest indoor event of the year, the diplomatic reception. The senior ambassadors arrive at the East Gate. Good evening. How are you? <laughs> Other, more junior diplomats have to make do with buses. I'd like to go to the right, please. Nearly a thousand diplomats from 157 nations are invited to this royal buffet and ball. Tonight, the Queen is helped by the Duke of Kent and his sister, Princess Alexandra. She's been doing official duties for 50 years. Did you say Anguilla? I said Anguilla, Because yes. I went to Anguilla. When? In 88, with oh, my yeah. husband. Oh, yeah, I got also it. Went to the like all working members of the royal family, she's funded by the Queen. She carries out around 130 engagements a year. You know I know your country. Do you? I gave it independence oh, in yes, 1960. Yes, of course. That's true, that's true. That's true, and you were raising the flag. Yes. Indeed. Long time I've never been back, sadly, but I'll you never have? forget it. Ibadan, Inugu, yes. my Dugari, Soccer 2. Oh, my goodness, you have I've a fantastic in my memory. Head. Very good. It's a very lovely country. Yes. Thank you. Princess Alexandra, who was there at our independence in 1960, reminded me that she was there and that uh, she had visited quite a few places. And the thing that amazed me was that she remembered the names of four or five of the different towns she had been to. Cayman Good to see you again. Yeah. Last time I saw you, you had a broken arm. That was in 1993, falling off of a horse. I had indeed, you're quite right. I arrived in, in, the, in, the, in the heat with my arms in a plaster. Don't push! Come on, guys. This is tiresome. Come on, guys. All we've got to do is move the trolley. Drive from the handle side. With so many guests, a large royal turnout is required to make everyone feel welcome. Tim O'Donovan, statistician of Windsor, keeps a record of the work of all the members of the royal family, including those less well known. The Duke of Gloucester's been a great worker, as the Duchess of Gloucester and the Duke of Kent and Princess Alexandra. Prince Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, is the Queen's first cousin, and currently 19th in line to the throne. He and his equerry are taking the train to Croydon to begin a day of engagements. He likes to do his homework on the train. Fully equipped mathematics rooms. What would you equip a mathematics room with? It's going to be like any other classroom, isn't it? The train is held up after a passenger incident. Just be a slight delay, so while we're... Okay, if you want to commit suicide in Purley, I suppose you're near the Purley gates. <laughs> <coughs> the Duke is patron of a large number of charities. Well, basically, it can be a lot or a little, really. Um, 
Some people just want you on the writing paper, so to speak, to make it look more respectable. The Duke was unable to pursue his chosen career as an architect after the unexpected death of his elder brother put him in the royal front ranks. Buildings remain a passion, and he's involved with several architectural organizations. That's the same architect. Uh, I'm not sure it's the same architect. It's similar. It was same era. Same era, yes. Anyway, could I say it's a great pleasure to come to Brygate School to uh, come and see your new ICT department. Um, and uh, I hope their fuses don't blow. <laughs> I don't expect huge crowds lining the streets as if, you know, Her Majesty came. It's as valid even without a great deal of fuss. There are hundreds and hundreds of things the Queen could do, and she'd obviously be exhausted if she did them all. And it's not quite the same us doing, but at least it's recognition. And I think that's what people like to a certain extent. See the practical side of things, but they mm. So do you think you'll go in the building industry? Yeah. Probably. You know, there are some things that you're interested in and some that you're not, and it's slightly difficult to, to feign an interest. And is this an insulated roof or is it drum with it rain? Not to take the view, am I enjoying myself, you know, would it I be better off at home, should I have come today? Which one might say if you thought the whole thing was a big holiday or a big ego trip. But I don't really think of it that way, you know, it's, it's what I do, so, so do it. What will happen when the Gloucesters stop doing engagements? I'm not sure. So I don't think that the, the children of the Gloucesters will ever be involved in um, royal engagements. If in future there will be fewer members of the family doing royal duties, a greater burden will fall on William and his younger brother, Harry. For the moment, they're following royal tradition and serving in the army, which gives them a chance to lead a relatively normal life. They are, though, patrons of charities, which offer a taste of the royal working life that awaits them. Harry, the youngest royal patron, has set up Centre Barley to help orphans and vulnerable children in Lesotho. He's done it with a friend, Prince Seso. Harry, this is Jemima, who does all the work. And this is Nick, who does the work Jemima doesn't do. <laughs> this is one of those rare meetings in which there are no apologies for absence. The charity has just appointed a country director, and arrangements are being made for his move to Africa. Just to let you know what we've been up to this quarter, there was a whole issue of could we find a house in Missouri. This is the issue of work permits, study permits, visas. P.A. box, and last but by no means least, the dog. <laughs> the dog. Um, getting a dog out to the Sutu is probably the bureaucratically most difficult thing to do in the world. <laughs> what is it? Is it Golden Labrador, isn't it? Is it? It's black. Oh, no. Oh, no. Is it? Oh, no. Is it? Yeah, he's there. It's in a box. Yeah, he's it's right. It's morning. Yeah. Really? Yeah. It's no one to look after. <laughs> They're not there. No, no, no. He's, uh, he's in Johannesburg having a, a bit of a rest there. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say, my suggestion at the start of the process was the dog should do a sponsored walk to the yeah. city. Because it would have been a lot easier. William has come to Tusk, his charity for protecting African wildlife. Yeah. Hi, Charlie. Hi, William. Okay. Lovely to see you. Thanks so much for coming. No, really good of you. It's really good of you. While William will never be able to have a conventional job, it's expected that he and his brother will have a more hands-on leadership role in some of their organisations. Very cool. Come on in, anyway. We'll show you around. We were going to do a little bit of a presentation. Okay. I mean. Uh, I mean, very informal. So I didn't use making any effort. <laughs> Not my thing. Uh, we were lucky because William spent part of his gap year in Africa, and by chance he came across a number of the projects and initiatives that were funding 
in those areas. And so um, that's how he became aware of, of our work. And, and um, we approached him a couple of years ago as to whether he would kindly consider becoming our patron. And, and fortunately, he said yes. It blew me away when my father told me how much he managed to raise, you know, the average, like, sort of 800,000 pounds just from paying Bono, raised for charities. It's yeah. amazing. It it's really incredible. is incredible. Mm. Um, so we're riding around a bunch of horses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> just finally then on fundraising, um, today's a big day. Um, uh, you, you may all privately know this, but... Um, <laughs> it was the event <laughs> <laughs> There was a leak in the papers. Um, Concert for Diana was announced this morning, and specifically will go into the public domain at 10 o'clock. The beneficiaries, uh, Harry has very kindly chosen Centre Bali, uh, as his nominated Sorry, beneficiary. Sorry, wrong not to, isn't that really? <laughs> <laughs> you would have had trouble in this This meeting would have turned nasty, I think. <laughs> 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 the Tusk name was growing, because I remember the, the, the first time I, I heard about them, um, the Daily Telegraph appeal. Yes. That was the best thing that happened to Tusk like that, because it was a massively well-backed campaign. Yes. And they were, you know, full of, it was full of um, information about how, you know, you managed to create this business and, and, and uh, for charity. Yeah, remain such a tiny sort of pinprick on that on the yeah, map as it were. Yeah, and how it absolutely. Been, and, uh, yeah, and the Telegraph appeal was two thousand and three, so that was the yeah, start of the nice. climb. You're absolutely right. You um, know, one of the wonderful things about you know having you as patron is it's just raising that profile yet again. I think it's on that. Especially you say that, you know, something all you know, that formality the other way that was really oh, what have we done? Oh, God. <laughs> William and Harry are starting out with charities to which they have a personal connection. For the moment, much of their work is low-key. Prince Andrew needs to keep his role as high-profile as possible. Nice to see you. All well? He's in Amman to sell Britain PLC during a three-week worldwide trip. I started in Germany last week. I then had to go to Doha to give a speech. I then went to Abu Dhabi uh, before going to Iraq, then to Kuwait, and then in uh, Riyadh tomorrow um, for most of the day, finishing up in Abu Dhabi, and then I head into uh, Saudi Arabia. Each year, half of his engagements are overseas. In the past, this has led to some negative press comment, but the prince is in Oman for business, not pleasure. Your Royal Highness, um, thank you very much for coming here to the British Ambassadors Business Group, which brings together a grouping of leading business... Um, um, and <laughs> oh, it's a merit to answer it as well. <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> Among other things, he wants to help a British company, Serco, win a contract to build a military college. And this PFI contract is going to last for 35 years? Um, uh, it's just been reduced to 20. We've agreed to a 20-year concession. We keep up a reasonably firm pace because there's so much to do. There are so many opportunities. There's not enough time to be homesick. You just get on with it. How are you this morning? Next morning, Prince Andrew has a briefing with the Circo team. Since I was last here, has the design changed at all? Have, has it developed, if you see what I mean? Because I remember seeing a very... It was a model I saw the last yes, time I was here. Yes, the uh, design has changed slightly. Well, I'll, I'll just go through it quite quickly. Having received his briefing from Serco, his next step is to lobby the minister. In the Middle East, it's hoped that he can be particularly effective. Oman is a traditional society, where the royal family also controls politics. So being a prince can open doors. Very good, thank you very much indeed. Prince Andrew is meeting the Minister for Commerce, His Excellency Makbul bin Ali bin Sultan. He's a member of the Omani royal family. They've submitted their final proposal yesterday, which was a good thing, but I hope that it progresses um, it swiftly. Because I really had, uh, in the earlier days when this happened, I had a number of meetings with the Minister of Defence and tried to convince him to take the private sector. This is a private this finance initiative and it's a, it's a very, very bold step yes. um, to take. Yes. And it's taken quite a lot of time to get the Ministry to understand how they run. Serco is in the final stages of negotiations for this billion dollar deal which is likely to start in 2008. There are occasions when 
you can have an effect. Um, but I'm very careful about when I do that. Does it annoy you how the British media um, portray these trips? I'm not even going to answer that question. <laughs> Why not? Well, I don't think it's necessary to answer it. Do you enjoy them? These trips? Yeah. I think these trips are, are, are tremendously valuable. So, uh, I mean, I think that's, the, that's the, the most important thing, is that they're valuable for the UK. And that's my purpose, is to, is to create value for the UK. All right? That's good. Thank good. you, sir. Thank you very much. They don't retire in the royal family, and the Duke of Edinburgh has been on royal duties for 55 years. As a former naval officer, he keeps close links with the armed forces. He's Colonel-in-Chief of the Queen's Royal Hussars, and he's come to see them in Basra, southern Iraq. You can pretty much expect to be mortared and rocketed on a, on a nightly basis. We were mortared last night in SLB. It's only one round. Uh, it was a rocket, in fact. It was, it was a rocket. It did explode, forcing on a road. There are dangers. Um, but if we didn't think that we could protect him properly, we wouldn't have invited him. He's doing something that will be very much valued by the soldiers who are serving out here. He is very interested in understanding about what we do and always ask the most pertinent questions. Where's home? Malawi. Malawi? <laughs> How did you get into this? <laughs> by mistake. No, by mistake. By <laughs> <laughs> Walked into a recruiting office thinking it was a holiday. <laughs> and we were engaged last week by a small arms fire attack. And thankfully, one of my top cover centuries returned fire and actually killed the insurgents, which is good news for us. You can sniff uh, explosives, is that Yes, I can, sir, yes. He's trained to search for uh, ammunition, weapons and explosives. Have you found any? Uh, I've only had him a week, sir. <laughs> yeah, so... Is he new to this? Or yeah, no, you take him over from somebody? He came from Northern Ireland and he's been out here for six months. So I'll have him for another six months. And then you hand him on something Yes, else? sir, yeah. And he's happy with it? Yeah, yeah, he seems to be happy. What's he called? Simba. Simba? Yeah. <laughs> I've known you are, I think he's wearing all the kit and equipment that you've just seen. That weighs about 40 kilograms, is what he's gone on at the moment. Have you fired that or let off a grenade? Uh, no, sir. Not yet. Not yet, sir. Hopefully Stop. not. As you can imagine, everybody at home, as you know perfectly well, has been, been following what's been going on in this part of the world. And I think most of us, with a great deal of sympathy, for those of you who are trying to do your best to make life uh, civilised and tolerable for the locals, with a bit of luck, you could do with this place what previous British people have done for the Gulf states. And look at them now. They're extremely well off. They're happy. They're prosperous. And they get on with each other. And it happened because of a people like you who left a bit of oil. But mind you, it's quite a lot of oil. It's nearly dawn, and Prince William and his fellow Sandhurst cadets are about to start their final early morning exercises before graduating as officers. So at the moment it's uh, about 0610, uh, and we've all been up for probably half an hour already. Uh, the parade doesn't actually start until 11, however, it just shows the amount of prep work that goes in before we actually get on the square today. Three generations of Windsors are at Sandhurst for William's passing out parade. He spent a year at the Royal Military Academy, training to be an officer. 
His girlfriend, Kate Middleton, has been invited as the prince's personal guest. Prince William's cast, Kate, er har også vores flot hat og kigger på ham. Officer Cadet Wales will be going on to join the household cavalry. It's unlikely William will see armed combat. But a career in the forces is, and has been for centuries, the basic training for a future king. Certainly that the connection between the, the Crown and the, and the armed forces has always been incredibly close. You know, as far as I was concerned, and my, my sons, I, I think it's very important to, to, um, to have that experience with other people and to, to be responsible for other people and to help look after them. I'm speaking to every individual one of you. When I say you are very special people, I send my congratulations to you all. It's a rite of passage for the young cadets passing out today. And now, they're free to celebrate with their families. For William, it's not just the start of his military career. It's a move closer to the throne. When the Queen was his age, she was only a year and a half away from becoming monarch. Like his father, the Prince of Wales, William will probably have to wait a very long time before he's king. Prince William carries an immense burden of expectation. In his lifetime, he has experienced great personal tragedy and witnessed the monarchy endure scandal and criticism. Prince Charles and his son will have to steer the crown through a fast-changing and unforgiving world. Meanwhile, the Queen carries on. She's now the oldest monarch in British history and by any standards, royalist or republican, she will be a formidable act to follow. You wear it in a very strange place, but otherwise it's all right. Um, dare I ask where? It's going well, is it? I'm doing all right. Ah, Starfleet. Thanks, ma'am. Andrew went to look at the helicopters, then, because that's, yes. that's his favorite. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Prime Minister's on the page. Get... It's not bad, is it? What a nice one.